All right, we are so glad this afternoon to have Yvonne here. And she is a board member of Coming Out Ministries, also a life coach. And uh, we'll let you tell a little bit more about how you're ministering in a variety of ways. But she comes from Heartland College, and we have great appreciation for Heartland and the different things that they're doing and the people they've prepared for ministry here. So let's uh, turn the time over to her, and we will go till 3.30 with this presentation. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right. Do I have the clicker? Should I pass it? Do you guys do it for me? That's it right there. It's, oh, it's here. Yeah, big button. That's this the is, go forward and that's the lady. That's a very yeah. modern. <laughs> Good afternoon. It has been a lot. You're brave. That means that you're connected and you wanted to know. So praise God for that. I, okay, baby, we should start with a word of prayer. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for so much, not only information, but such a blessing, Lord, that we get to know with each one in particular. We are receiving light. Thank you so much. Be with us, Lord, and continue enlightening our minds and hearts. How can we stand today in principles to face with faith and bravery, Lord, and courage uh, the situation that is in this world? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I really appreciate what the Village Church is doing. Why? Because every, everywhere I travel, every time I have to coach people in regards to the LGBT community, every time I have to hear young people who have gone through trauma, abuses, and addictions, what I've seen is that the topic of sex is the topic that is less talked in the family. Most families just do the one conversation. Oh yes, I spoke to my kids about sex. And pretty much the message is what not to do instead of what they can do, how they do, and, and teach them. So it's the less topic, it's the topic that we speak less in the house and at home. Pretty much sometimes parents, fathers said to the wife, talk to her, talk to him, you know. And it's the last topic spoken here at church. How many um, sexual seminars do we have for young people? And one thing, and the other thing, is that the book that it speaks about sexuality in the Bible, which is the book? Songs and Psalms. is the book that less people understand. Can you open the book and say, wow, today I was inspired with the truth of this book? <laughs> you hardly understand what it says. And let me tell you, about young people, no idea about the message. So, is the topic that is less, that we talk less at home? The book that we less understand is the book is to speak about sexuality and the percentage of seminars on sexuality in churches every Sabbath. Is the less seminars that we talk with. So the less we speak about this at church, the more the world is scream at it, as you can see in every presentation. So we should raise up the banner and start speaking about healthy sexuality, no taboos, because the world doesn't have any taboo. It's teaching falsehoods that many things that we thought, how is it gonna be the end of the time? It's coming in a way that we didn't think before. I was, I, when I saw this morning Dr. Nedley, who could imagine 15 years ago that the issue of anxiety and depression was gonna take over the church? None. Why? Because we were Christians, we were connected with Jesus. How come we were gonna be, we were gonna be depressed or have anxiety? And his program is over all churches today. So there are many things taking place that we didn't think in the past. So let's, all right, let's begin the beginning. My topic is about intimacy and connection, forging identity. We have, do we have an identity problem today? Yes. Yeah. Why do parents have to be issued legally if the kid wants to change the gender? The problem is not what is happening legally, even though that's the current situation, and I appreciate so much the previous presentation. The problem is, how come that kid wants to change the gender? So God says in Genesis 
1.26. Then God let us said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. There's so much depth in this Bible verse. But the way God created us, it, is, it, it talks about it. And, and just look at the pictures. God said, let us make man in our image. Man is going to be like us. But the way, the way that he did it, when he created the whole creation, God spoke and it was. But when it became to man, what happened? He took the dust. He held it hand to hand. He touched his body. He touched every part of the body. And he created. He was delighted in what he was doing. And finally, he kissed him. And he kissed his life because it says that he breathed it. Right? That's a scene of intimacy. We were created in intimacy. God didn't say, be done, the man. He touched. He manufactured every piece because that's the essence of humanity. We were created in intimacy. So what was going to happen? When Adam opened his eyes after being touched, after being crafted, after God delighted in what he was doing, he opened his eyes and he saw him. And he started speaking. So now Adam is ready to forge his identity in getting to know the one that created him, and now is, is forming his identity in every conversation, in every look, in every thing they did, did together. Why? And there is a principle here. And the principle comes here. So we can say that intimacy, intimacy that happened to Adam comes in four, we can say, in, there are four types of intimacy, and we can see it here. Emotional intimacy, the capacity that we have of expressing feelings with no fear. Adam started talking to his creator, and he didn't have any fear, sin was not present, and they can talk, and they just start merging each other, the creator and the creature. There is a scene of intimacy. The creation was intimacy. Then they start talking. Then it comes the physical intimacy. Was there any physical intimacy at creation? Yes. Hand with hand, touching the body, then kissing him and, and giving his life. The Lord gave life through the physical touch. Then it came the intellectual intimacy. Those are the four types of intimacy that, that takes place for two merging in one. And the intellectual intimacy and experiential intimacy happened when the Lord told Adam, put names to the animals. Actually, uh, Wagoner speaks about this sin in a marvelous way. He says that God was testing if it was unity between the creator and the, and the, um, the, creator and the creature, if Adam could see in every animal the design of God, understanding God and the author in every animal and could name it right, that was, that was a connection between the creator and the creature. And it happened. Adam got it. And Adam, through every animal, he could see was the intention. What was the intention of the creator? That meaning that his mind was in a tune with the mind of God. So that was intellectual connection and intimacy. And experiential intimacy is when you share experience, when you are open enough to share experiences in life and you get delighted even to tell the things, everything that happened, positive or negative. So this type of four um, types of intimacy were present when God was dealing with Adam. Why, why are we talking about this? Because when we talk about intimacy and, and the connection with identity, every identity formation has to be in the context of connection and intimacy. Period. Can you see it from the beginning, from the creation? God intimate with Adam. They connected. Physical, emotional, intellectual, experiential intimacy. Because he knew that if there's no intimacy and connection, there couldn't be an identity formation. You got it? You got it? So when we talk about that we have so much of identity problem, what are we talking about? Hmm? 
And let me tell you that identity is not only with the child, or what my child is going to be. Couples, husband and wife, develop an identity, yes or no? A church develops an identity, yes or no? A parental style develops an identity. The kid develops an identity. And lastly, do we create an identity with God? So that's a key factor. And since we have short time, this, this takes me four classes at Harlem. <laughs> so I will go to the point. Intimacy and connection is key for developing a true, deepest identity. Lack of that creates disasters. Hmm? And when we have religion without connection and intimacy, how is that calling in the church level? Hmm? How is that called? So many things, right? So many things. So we are going to describe some of them. So what is intimacy? Our souls crave for intimacy. It's not a sin. When we feel the desire to be accepted, to be cared for, to be, to be wanted by someone, to be loved by someone, that's not sin. That's the way we were created. The problem is how we look for those things to be fulfilled. So intimacy, what it means is into me see. You see there? Into me see. That, that, that's one of the definitions. It is a blending of our hearts with another's so we can see into who they really are and they can see into us. There is something that we all long for and it is how God made us. We were designed to connect, period. You were designed, any person, any age, we were designed to connect and have intimacy. Let's look at the next one, yeah. So is only intimacy happening at the level of a couple? No, no, look at the picture. That baby wants intimacy. So, so we were designed for connection. We were designed for connection. And when we talk about connection and intimacy, we can be damaged also in intimacy and connection. So, so how can that happen? What if a kid or a young person is broken in intimacy, in a very connection, a connected relationship is broken? Where the mix of a life with another person, a person in authority, brought pain, shame, and dignity damage? What happened when in that precious, intimate, intimate connection, a person is broken, a kid is broken? In that context, I want to ask, is LGBTQ plus really a choice? We say that it's a choice, but I've learned something different, hearing so many young people, and I'm going to tell you the cases, but every time I have a transgender woman or man in front of me, and they are the children of elders, and they are children of pastors, Adventist or evangelical. When I have to speak with a gay person, the thing that I ask them is, tell me your story. And they have a story. And I've realized that they didn't choose. When they said, when I was seven, I was attracted to men. The, the boy is telling me that story. And he said, tell me that story. Tell me how was your relationship with your mom and dad. I can clearly see in every case that in their case, there was not a choice. That was the path that the kids were left and they didn't realize about that. Unless a child is, is sexually molested when they are looking for, a boy is looking for another boy and they feel attracted to boys, at the age of six or seven, pretty much is not sexual. They are trying to look for what? Another boy, because boys are boys. And pretty much that boy is not connected in intimacy with the father. Probably the father is at home. Probably the father is working so much. Probably the father is providing, but the father is not connected in an intimate way. So the boy is like flying, like a little leaf, flying to see where he's going to be hanging, where something stop it. And they look for another boy because they really desperately know, not thinking, how boys behave, how men behave. And they look for that and they said, I've been attracted by men or I've been attracted by women since I've been seven or eight. 
And when we ask them about the relationship with the parents, we see it. They don't see it, but we see it. So, so it could happen damage. And in many cases, LGBT for them was not a choice. But you know what are the good news of the gospel? That is the choice for them today to choose differently, to decide what they want to do, because sometimes sin was committed against them, and now they can choose other way. That's the good news. That if they couldn't choose, now they can choose. Those are the good things that we have for them, the, our message. So we see, I crave physical touch, and a sense of intimacy is something more than sex. And Dr. Nedley did something amazing uh, today in the morning, speaking about sex and how the crave for intimacy Many of us and many young people, what they want is intimacy, not sex. And, but they, they confuse that. Sex can be the must, and now I'm quoting a book, Soul Craving. Sex can be the most intimate and beautiful expression of love, but we are only lying to ourselves when we act as if sex is proof of love. Too many men demand sex as a proof of love. Too many women have given sex in hopes of love. We live in a world of users where we abuse each other to do the pain of aloneness. We all long for intimacy, and physical contact can appear as intimacy, at least for a moment. So the real need of a person is intimacy, because they can have providers at home, maybe one, maybe two, but they are not emotional connected. They don't have that sense of who's knowing me just as I am, without filters. Remember, we live in the age of filters. Everything is a filter. Everything is a filter. I have to show myself better than I really am. But who's going to accept me without, without filters? I need that person in my life. When it's not mom, dad, or the person's in authority in life, the person is having that longing. And pretty much sex will come as yes. And especially if a person had a problem or had a past with sexual abuse, they are sexualized and they might think that's the way I look for intimacy. But the need is still void in the heart. Uh, just a question with the previous one. Do you think the Samaritan woman, is this one, this one, okay, all right. Do you think the Samaritan woman was looking for sex? When Jesus asked her, bring your husband. Seven men, six or seven? Do you think she was looking for sex? No. She was looking for intimacy. Who can take me as I am? Who can love me? Who can accept me? But she was sexualized. And sex was the wrong line message telling her this is the way. I work with so many girls, with so many girls that do the sex texting. Can you imagine sex texting for a 12-year-old when even her body is not formed? But she sent the pictures, and when I asked them, tell me what do you experience when you send one of those pictures? Oh, I wish I could record those things so you can see what's behind. They said, he tells me he loves me, and that makes me feel good. He texts me I'm pretty, and I like to hear that. One, one told me once, uh, he told me that I looked beautiful, and I felt very good. But then I ended up in a hotel, and he, and, and he physically abused her. That was not nice. And then, but you sent another picture. Say, yes, because, you know, feeling beautiful and feeling lovable. Is, is, that, is that my problem, she asked me, 13-year-old. Then I have to ask the story. Tell me, tell me a little bit about home. Oh, you want to talk about my mad and my dad, you know? So there's not connection, there's not intimacy. Young people crave for intimacy. So when Jesus said, when Jesus said, and the two shall become one, we know that he was not referring only to the physical. Why? Because the biblical oneness that he speaks and explains, and I have some of those quotes later, for John 17, God is one, but God is three, right? We believe in the Father, 
Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. They are three, but they are one. Where is the oneness relying on? The one in the sense that he is a fundamental unity. He is one, one in what? They are three in one, one in purpose, one in character, and one in plans. So he is not three God, he is one God. So the unity that it speaks is about character, is about purpose and plans. That's the real unity and, uh, and the biblical oneness that it speaks. That's why when we talk about sexuality, it's not about the body. It's not what happened with the body. It's what happened in the spirit, in, car in, in character and in purpose. And young people would like to experience that. They don't have that. So the only choice they have what is, the, is the physical. And that's what they fall into. But my question is, are they seeing that at home? Are they experiencing that oneness in mom and dad? Is that the image that they see every day? Or there is something missing in the picture? Real intimacy. Real intimacy makes us feel alive. Ooh. Why? Because we were created for connectedness and intimacy. So that means that make us feel alive. When people are falling in love, Oh, they can do so many things. We, we feel like, oh, that's, I, can, I can die tonight, but I don't want to die. You know, I, I'm full. Like we had been found, as if someone finally took the time to peer into the depths of our soul and really see us there. That's intimacy. Finally, someone knows me as I am, and someone wants me. That's intimacy. Until we experience true intimacy, we will feel passed over and ignored, like someone is looking right through us. So the desire for intimacy, the need for intimacy, that someone knows me as I am and is still want me. But can it only happen with that couple? When we talk about those things, we tend to feel in the husband and wife relationship, when we talk about intimacy, let me tell you something, that that child wants and needs connectedness and intimacy? Yes, it doesn't happen only in couples. Look at that child's eyes. He craves for intimacy. And the way the mother fits him talks about intimacy. But do you think it happened only when we were kids? Do you think that girl, seven-year-old, craves for intimacy? Yes. Oh, excuse me, that just happened when we get married, when we were children. Do you think that couple crave for intimacy? At every level, doesn't have age, doesn't have gender. That's the real craving. The world says, LGBT, choose what you want. That's where you find intimacy, sex. No, the Lord says, intimacy and connection is what creates identity, but we need to see what is, the, what is the real source? So we all want to be known at any age, the baby, the seven-year-old, the teenager, now the couple that is getting, getting ready to get married, at 40, at 50, at that age, is a need, is a need. The same quote here, real intimacy makes us feel alive, like we have been found. Oof. Jesus is looking at the Samaritan woman, and she was found. Was she found? She was found. As if someone finally took the time to peer into the depths of our soul and really see us there. When Jesus was telling her, go and bring your husband, well, you know what he was doing? He was having intimacy with her. He was getting into that depth into her soul, and the message was, I see you as you are, and I still want you. That's what he was doing. He was intimacy, he was having intimacy with her. Bring your husband. And you know what she did? She did what we do, religious people. Use religion to avoid intimacy. But where should we gather together? Where should we worship? Because that was the issue in that time. And the Lord let her go around and then comes again, having intimacy with her. The message was, I want to see you without filters because I still want you. 
why she was at noon time taking water. Because she couldn't be seen by others, because she was a sinner. She was rejected by society. Having a still, I work with Muslim women, and I coach Muslim women in Jordan. Oh, in Jordan. Until the day of today in Jordan, if a woman is caught in that situation, it's really, really, really difficult. It's still in Jordan. There are some other countries that are not that, that um, conservative, let's say that way. But in Jordan, that would happen today. Can you imagine 2,000 years ago? And Jesus is trying to look for that depth of her soul. And it was not nice going into that depth. But he was establishing intimacy and connection. Not because she was good, but because that's his work, because he knows that she could have never develop an identity of a daughter of God if someone is not connected on an intimate level. You see that? Because the process, and I'm going to repeat myself, the process of forming identity has to be in the context of connection and intimacy. So he's doing that. And he's asking the very difficult question. And he says, I know you don't have a husband now because the man that you have is not your husband. What happened with her? What was her response to that? Someone intimate with her? And she said, is this the Messiah? And she went to tell everybody that finally she was known without filters and she was not rejected. Because she didn't, she was not looking for sex. She was looking to be known and to be accepted. And Jesus offered her that. And she said, this has to be the Messiah. And she was the first evangelist. Right? Was she? Yes. The first missionary. That's why when I have in front of me a transgender woman that is a man and comes with all his sins, I just see these cases because I know that I, they need to find someone who can connect with them at an intimate level without criticizing them. You know why? Because they are craving for intimacy. And if we as a church offer that to them, what could happen? What could happen? So, what happened, and I want to see this picture, sadly, we can miss out on intimacy that can make us and another person feel known. When we predeterminate what we think we should see, when we examine their life, heart, personality, and soul. When this happens, we will try to mold and to make them into who we believe they should be, as a result, we are blinded to their good qualities, and love and intimacy are destroyed. This picture is not a real picture. I cannot show the real picture out of confidentiality. I cannot tell his real name. I'm, I won't even name uh, the country. But it looks pretty much to a transgender woman that I'm working with. And the only question I ask when a transgender person or an LGBT community person comes to me for coaching, the only question I ask is, are you willing to let God be part of the process? Regardless of their religion, if they say yes, I get in. If they say no, I don't care about God, I probably will have a friendship with them, but I wouldn't coach them. But when they said yes, I'm willing God, even though I don't read the Bible, they tell me, even though I don't go to church, no, no, are you willing to, be, to, to allow God to be part of the process? Say yes. So a man looking just like that. I think it's, as a woman, look even prettier. Because I couldn't, at the beginning, I was just kind of confused. Oof, it looks like a real woman, and it's pretty. And he came. What would it happen when, you, when I tell you how to develop intimacy and connection when someone looks like that? Hmm? Is that a challenge? Is that a challenge? I'm not saying, I'm not saying we should say everything you do is fine. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. Because the result will come if we know and we follow the same steps that Jesus did when he found someone that it was the outcast of the culture. So if you focus on all that the person is not, 
and how the person is behaving, you will miss what he is. I've learned that when we ignore another person's beauty and all that God made them to be, intimacy is lost. You cannot connect. You cannot connect. When you are focused on what? On what the person looks like or the, the behavior of the person. I know many parents that cannot connect with their kids because they hate what the kids are doing. But that hate, the, the, the kid can feel it, and it's like a barrier to the parent. That's the way you lose intimacy. Why? Because intimacy flows out of the feeling of being wholly accepted just the way we are. Am I telling you, do we accept and tell them they are doing okay? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that sometimes we can intimate and establish good connections with people that are like us, not like look like them. So, look what he says there. We should be blasters and not correctors. That's what, that's what the Lord is calling us is calling us to be. So let me read again. If we focus on all that the person is not and how the person is behaving, you will miss what he is. And we ignore another person's beauty and all that God made them to be. In that moment, when we focus on the things that they are not of the behavior, we lose connection. Let me tell you what happened to me years, some years ago. I've been working seven years in the maximum security prison in Virginia with women who have been there for, gonna be there for 30, 40 years of a lifetime. And um, the statistics said that 97% they were active or they, they did or have some uh, LGBT lifestyle, 97. We had around uh, seven to 25 women in the Bible class every Friday. That means that 97% of them are active or have an LGBT, uh, LGBT lifestyle. So that's why I get in contact with the LGBT community. And the beautiful thing is that I didn't know how to work with LGBT community. I didn't even know Michael. I didn't even was close to um, coming out ministries, but the Lord took me to prison for a reason, because I became to like this person and to love them there and to see they are human beings, and to see they have an amazing need for connection, and they were looking in the wrong place, sex, LGBT, that's what they need, no, that's what they don't need. One day, that was, that was in prison, that was not in the maximum security prison, that happened the last year when I, I was moved to a um, jail. A woman came, and she was coming to every Bible study. She was a tall, big woman, hard face, Kind, she was kind, she was fighting with everybody, she was negative, she was always fighting with the guards, that is a big issue in prison, and she brought kind of a negative environment to the Bible study. We already knew when Stacy would come, we go like, oh, Stacy is coming, but that's fine. One day, I was teaching the Bible study about the conflict between good and evil, and I was telling them about how Lucifer fell and all this conflict, uh, amazing facts, Bible studies. And she stood up and said, all the characteristics that you're saying about Satan, that's me. You know, she, she, was a cha she challenged the whole class, that's me. I identified with Satan. What can you say in the middle of a Bible study when the others want to learn about the Word of God and I have my Harlem students and suddenly she comes with that? You cannot leave that hang up to say, okay, we talk after the Bible study. No, you have to say something. Because she's saying, every, but she was serious. Everything that you're mentioning about Satan, that's me. The only thing that came out of my mind in that moment was like, you must have a story. And she said, yes, I have a story. Would you like to share with us? I said, yes. When I was 12, she said, my dad was my everything in my life. Just, just to illustrate about this principle, it was everything in my life. One day I came from school, and he had killed himself in the living room, and I was the first person that I found my father, 12 years old. So from that moment, you know, she was sleeping in the same spot when he died for a week. She was sleeping there, and she started thinking, oh, I want to die because I want to be with him. I couldn't make him happy. But now, if I go where he is, 12-year-old mind, I can make him happy because I failed to make him happy. 
One week later, someone came. She never mentioned the mother. Someone came and said, I have something that you need. Do you have a lot of pain? She said, yeah, something hurts here, she said. She's telling us the story in front of everybody. And the person gave her an alcohol, alcohol. She said, drink that and you won't feel the pain anymore. And she said, since that moment, I was hooked up with alcohol. And I'm here today in this Bible study telling you that every time I have alcohol, I feel the demons coming to me. That's what I'm saying, that I'm like Lucifer. What do you have to tell me in the Bible study? And she said, and I mean, she speaks with this southern accent I couldn't understand. And she said, I been 18 times in prison. So I asked her, 18 times? She said, no, eight, zero, 80 times in prison. And I don't want to be 81 times. What can you tell me about hope and God? Remember, she's a, she's a woman that challenged. I just have the time to say, Lord, help me. You know, that was the only thing. I, I was like, poof, with that story, with that pain, 80 times in prison, with that face, with that hardness, I just said, Lord, help me. And believe me, it's, it's by God's mercy. I didn't think what I say. It just came out of my mouth. And when I said it, I was kind of amazed thinking of what I was saying. And that happened to me that time. And it's, not, it's for God's glory. The only thing that came out of my mind, I said, the only thing that Satan cannot take out of you is the fact that you were created in the image of God. And she felt the message. And she said, explain to me what it means. You were created in the image of God. The, Satan cannot take that away from you. She said, we continue the Bible study. And at the end, she said, probably I will leave prison in one month. Can you, can you tell me more about that? That is the first time. But she was almost crying. She left prison, and we were having Bible studies in a facility where her mother was in that city, and I was meeting with her out of prison for two months every day to explain to her what it means that she was created in the image of God. Because for the first time, she thought that she belonged to God, and she didn't know that. So when we look at a face like that, or a face like that woman say, I'm the devil, how can you create connection and intimacy? Just with the truth and a kind heart, not rejecting what you're seeing. You cannot let yourself be, be, uh, be drawn by the behavior of the person. Why? Because this is the behavior. We need to understand how it works. This is the behavior. Can you see that tree? Let's suppose that what you see up there are the fruits. What are the fruits that we see of that tree? Fornication, adultery, strip clubs, pornography, affairs, masturbation, homosexuality, internet with sexual content, prostitutes. It's like all those are like the fruits of the trees. If you want to fight only the fruit, you get up into the tree, you take out the fruit, and what happened? It will come out again. Just give it time, right? What is producing those fruits? You see, the roots, the roots nobody sees. Nobody sees how extension of those roots. But what are the fruits? I have to pretend I'm bad, I'm unlovable, it's my fault, I'm alone, I'm rejected, I'm forsaken, I don't belong, I'm dirty and unclean. Those negative thoughts is what produces, actually, a negative thought that is behind pornography is, you know what, you're, you're undeserving. You are not wanted. And pretty much people go to the pornography because there is a woman that wants them. That's the negative thought behind. That's the lies of Satan behind. So that's why we cannot see the behavior, because the behavior is just like the fruit. But we can look at the roots. Jesus cannot identify with anybody in the fruit because he didn't sin. He cannot identify with adultery. He cannot identify with homosexuality because we have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, right? Because he didn't sin. He didn't sin. He can be touched. He can understand everything that we go through, but he didn't sin. But he can identify with us in the roots. Was he tempted? to believe that he was alone, rejected, and forsaken? 
Yes, and that's what it's taking. That's what it takes a person to the other fruit. Um, was he tempted with the thought that he had to pretend that he was not wanted, that he was not loved? With all these negative thoughts, yes. That he was unlovable, yes. They were crucifying him. So, how can we identity is formed in the context of intimacy and connection? That's the key point that I want to leave in your, in your hands. And probably for the sake of time, Pastor, right? It's almost time, five minutes. <gasps> I like, all right. Look what he says here. But that intimacy begins with you as a leader. I want to talk to the pastors. No, I don't want to talk to the pastors. I want to talk to the parents here. That intimacy with, begins with you. Perhaps you are wondering how you can build an intimate relationship. In addition to accepting another person just how they are. Note, this doesn't mean accepting any form of abuse. And we will need another seminar for this. Not accepting abuse. But how can I accept another person as they are? I'm not accepting their sin. I'm, I'm not promoting that. No, we are talking about a person as they are, how the Lord Jesus could receive that woman, Samaritan woman. And um, it says, real intimacy can only begin once, once you know yourself, since the definition of intimacy essentially means in into me see. How can anyone see into you and who you are, your fears, your dreams, your hopes and desires, unless you know who you are and are willing to allow someone in. Sometimes we don't allow people in. We don't allow intimacy. Experiencing true intimacy begins with, the, with, the, with being connected to your own heart. So I want to talk to here with something I found. There are many pastors calling to coming out ministries. And coming out ministries referred them to me and, and some other people. I'm not the only one. We have a team, powerful team. And, uh, and, and we talk to them. But I'm going to talk what is referred to me. Pastors. I'm going to tell the country all over the world uh, with, a, with a position in the church. And their kids. We are talking about good people here. Raising up the kid, doing devotions in the morning and in the afternoon. And now the girl is saying that she's queer, that she's homosexual. And the pastor called coming out ministry saying, I don't know what to do. Or there is someone in my church that I saw, you know, growing up in the church. And now it's 14, 15 and has this strange hairstyle and we believe it's homosexual. What can we do? So this issue brings on one side shame. Because if it's in my home... What are people going to say? What kind of father or pastor I am? And it's happening like this. It's happening so much that it's just amazing. So it brings shame on one side, but it brings conflict on the other side because if that happens in the church, that brings a lot of tension. The way the pastor handled it. It's not easy. Is that easy? It's not. Oh, especially when it's the daughter of the elder is the daughter of the de le leader and now that girl is a terrible influence and the other parents are oh, she's gonna damage my kid Whew, i don't want to be in those shoes but those pastors are calling a lot what i found and that's why i want to be honest what i found when i received these calls is that the pastor works a lot and is spent a lot in their identity as pastors and the whole family runs around their identity as pastors. Where are we going this Sabbath? No, I have to preach in, in, they have three churches. In this church, and everybody goes there. They are not asked. And the kids and this wife develop the identity of the wife of a pastor. They have to be, you know, doing things. And, and he invests so much time in the identity as pastors. And I'm talking about good people here. I'm not talking about bad people. But the identity of a man is here. They don't have time to do exercise. They don't have time to connect with their kids and going to play with them. They don't have time. There are so many things that I found. They don't have time to study the Bible because sometimes it leads to burnout because we are talking about committed people. One pastor told me, I left my skin in the Word of God. 
in South America. He had 20 churches. I don't know if you believe, but some people in South America that has 20 churches and a school and a lifestyle center. And he said, I left my skin in the Word of God. And he was suffering from a burnout. And I asked him, do you have time to study the Bible? Not taking one Bible verse for the program that you have for that day. No, that you study the Bible just for yourself. Not thinking in the program, not thinking in the sermon, not thinking in anything. Pretty much the pastors that I talk to, doesn't matter the age, because I'm working with the son of a president of a union in a country, and he was having a burnout, and another pastor and another pastor, guess what's the answer? No. No, when I study the Word of God, I have to take the sermon, the program, the... No, 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 no. It's studying for yourself, not taking every, not even a single passage, because it's for you. Then you can take time from the Bible, as you work, they said no. Take time for your exercise. Taking time to connect with your kids. Taking time to be with them when they need. They said no. So that in inversion, I mean, they invest in the identity as a person, but the identity as a man is here. So you know what happened? There is a disconnection at home. The wife might develop the identity of the wife of a pastor, and they are leaders in the church, but at home, they don't connect. At home, the wife feel that they don't have emotional intimacy with the husband because they are working so hard. And he is just turning off fires all the time. What do I find? Fathers in codependency or highly independent, disconnected from family and highly connected with his job or ministry. They develop a performance-based identity. Some, somehow, if I stop, <gasps> No, 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 I need to keep working for God. I cannot stop. If a person, if a man in ministry cannot stop to connect at that level as a man, there is a problem here. Probably they develop a performance-based identity. And I'm saying because I'm coming out of that. I'm preaching this because I have to study this. I have two daughters. One is married, 26 years old. The other one is 15. And that happened to me with my oldest daughter. And I was saving the world. But I, and my daughter, she was not abused. I was responsible. I left her with responsible, the spiritual people, but she resented when she was 16 year old because she didn't have me. So I'm talking about here out of an experience, okay? So what I find, performance-based identity, everybody at home runs around the pastor, the wife develops the pastor-wife identity, but at home there is distance, no connectedness, an emotional level, and he might cope his disconnection with himself because that man have needs, please. And he's disconnected from his body to do exercise and to apply many good things that the Bible has said and even the LNG White. He's not because he's busy all the time. How he's gonna cope with his disconnection if he has needs? And probably the disconnection has happened for years with his wife. So if He's a moral person, he probably he will cope with more religion. And he's not flirting, adultery, and pornography. And I just follow up with the thought of Tony when he was preaching here. So that's pretty much what's gonna happen. But what the message here is, if those are the homes that I find where they say, talk to my kid, even if he's not the LGBT community or other behaviors, I need to go to the parents again. And what happened with the parents? And, and, and there is something here. The, the God connected with Jesus, and Jesus connected with his father, not from the Messiah identity, but he connected as a man. And in Gethsemane, we see a man pleading. That man took time to connect it with the disciples, to connect with the father, to pray, connect with his body, with himself. So then, if a person is connected, they can receive the light of God and they are one unit. That was the Lord Jesus. And just because he connected in his identity as a man, then he could be the Messiah. So when a man puts so much in their identity as a pastor, but their identity as a man is here, and he knows he's neglecting the kids, but it's for God. It's for God. The kid doesn't understand that when he's 16, 17 years old. So what happened? We need... God needs to connect with the leaders at, as men so they can connect with them, 
with their families, so then they can be the pastors that will reach the world, just because of one thing. And with this, I finish. There is more, but just because of this. <clears throat> because God made us, he intimately knows us better than anyone, than anyone can. For this reason, he can make us feel known in a way that no one on earth is able to. So that intimacy is just the place of God. Not marriage is intended to fill you 100%. That's a lie. No. That intimacy, only God. That is the creator. And he's a jealous God. He doesn't want anyone to take his place. So out of that abundance, you can stand your wife, your kids, your husband, right? We can experience a true definition of intimacy in an indescriptible way when we are getting connected with him. Intimacy with God through his son, Jesus, has been the most rewarding and life-changing experience offered to us. That they may be one as we are one. Look at, the, look at the language of intimacy of John 17. I in them and you in me. So they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you send me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. The experience of 144,000 were people that were not performing anymore. They didn't develop, they, they renounced, the Martas renounced to a performance-based identity. They didn't, they didn't perform to their job ministry. They connected with Jesus in their flesh, as human beings, as men, as women. The 144,000 learned to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And that's why they can participate of the letter rain. Can you imagine so many people from the LGBT community and, 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 um, surrounded by darkness can hear people that have the ability to intimate and connect in a sermon? Ooh. But just people that are connected with themselves, with their families, with God, at a human level, they can preach sermons that don't reach people intellectually. LGBT community are not going to reach intellect. No, no they, you get sued legally, we saw in the previous presentation. They're going to be touched by people who can connect in the preaching in an intimacy-connected way, just as Jesus found the Samaritan woman, just as Jesus found Mary, just as Jesus found the rich ruler. They can speak about the thin that is blocking them, their connection with God, but the Holy Spirit is gonna be with them. Because this message is gonna be given how? Father, as you are in me, so they might be with us, so they can be complete in a unit. Then the world know that you have sent me. Who's gonna accept the challenge to be connected? We need to be connected in order to receive the people that the Holy Spirit is going to bring here, including the LGBT community. Not condemning what we see, not applauding what they do, mm -mm. but receiving them in connection. We hunger for connection, and in here there is no LGBT, there is no Muslims, there is no atheists. All human beings connect ourselves in this flesh, need and needed for intimacy and connection. The people of God should be people that are experts in connection. So that's my challenge for today, that God will help us to receive this message and give this message in this light. May God bless.